Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. Um, and I think Sharon and I would really like to just take this opportunity to say a really big thank you to you and your team. Um, you know, without kind of without all of the, you know, the invisible uh, support that we get, this wouldn't be possible. So really big thank you uh, to all of you guys over there as well. So uh, really excited uh, to welcome you to our um, our session. A little knowledge goes a long way. Um, and I think we're going to start. I think I'm going to introduce you, Sharon. Uh, OK. So the absolute pleasure of working with my <laughs> lovely colleague, uh, Sharon Henham Dale. Um, so what can I tell you about Sharon? So Sharon's been in education for 28 years. Um, she's had experience of teaching across lots of phases, early years, primary and lower secondary. Um, and she's worked in lots of different schools and contexts, both as a teacher, but also as a senior leader. Now, I can absolutely tell you that when if you've had the pleasure of seeing Sharon or working with Sharon, you will know that <laughs> she is so passionate about everything she does. But in particular, building that capacity and that sustainability in schools really through that professional development a little bit like that we're doing today. Um, in particular, she is absolutely fantastic at leadership development at all levels really striving um, and I hope you don't mind me saying this Sharon to really enhance uh -huh. those organizational effectiveness to really improve outcomes for learners um, since 2012 Sharon has worked uh, in as an education and leadership consultant and she continues to coach school leaders and she joined lucky for me the team of Cambridge and the lovely team of Cambridge trainers back in 2017 so it's an absolute pleasure to be able to co-present with you again Sharon thank you very much Alison that's very kind of you so I have got the great pleasure of introducing Alison to you all this morning as well and um, I'm delighted to be working with Alison um, now Alison has been in education for 27 years and she's taught in primary she's also taught uh, within early years and also um, in lower secondary as well now some of you may um recognize Alison's name or some of you may have had the absolute pleasure of working with Alison as well because she's actually been working with Cambridge for quite some time now since 2011 it's actually your 10th anniversary this year Alison <laughs> <laughs> so Alison's first um work with Cambridge took her out to work with Tra uh, to, with teachers in Egypt that was her very first uh, assignment with Cambridge and she is absolutely passionate about um, working with teachers and working with schools which took her down that pathway of becoming a, an education advisor now many of you will know Alison because she wears so many different hats but particularly one of her absolute passions is mathematics so you may have seen Alison's name on lots of the blogs on the Cambridge um, website because she does lots of work around all the new developments with the new primary a low secondary curriculum with mathematics and she's also done a lot of work supporting remote learning during the last 12 months as well so lots of things um, that Alison has written and also uh, delivered um, that are available as well on the Cambridge site um, but she's absolutely passionate about mathematics and if you've had the pleasure of training with Alison you'll know that she always brings something that's very glittery orientated along with her so her sessions are fantastic they're full of fun but also full of lots of glitter I think it's uh, uh, and that's how we, we all often think about you, Alison, as well. We always have the, the glitter, which is wonderful. Um, but Alison is now freelance education and a maths advisor. And she, as I said, she works in so many different capacities for Cambridge as well. Lots of training, lots of different events, such as this one, and conferences, um, but also working on uh, the virtual and the on face to face training as well. And of course, she's authored many books as well. So there's a fantastic book that she's just brought out called The Trainer Toolkit, um, which where she shares some of her many, many fantastic tips from over the years as working in training. So, Alison, it's a pleasure to be back working with you again today. Uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Great. Well, um, OK, well, I think we should start with this session. So um, let me just give you the overview, that kind of that big picture of what we want to do with you in the next uh, 53 minutes. So we are obviously the whole conference is thinking about, you know, how we can really maximise and use remote education effectively. And we're just going to set the scene about what we mean by remote education, just so that we're all on the same page. But of course, we're not going to go into that in a huge amount of detail. 
we're then going to consider what is it that current research can tell us about how we learn because obviously that ties back to our big overview of a little knowledge goes a long way we're going to introduce you to the less is more concept and you'll hear us using that phrase throughout this session so what is it that we want to, children to learn and why do we want them to learn that? Two really key questions. And then finally, we're going to really talk to you about thinking about lesson design and delivery through that remote education context. And that phrase, again, that we use, that idea about perhaps in order to have a little knowledge but make sure it goes a long way, children and our learners need to go deeper and think harder. So hopefully that's kind of whetting your appetite. Um, so I'm going to move straight on to just thinking a little bit about what are we thinking when we are thinking about remote learning. And I know that Rhonda did that fantastic keynote, um, gosh, that it feels ages ago now, doesn't it? Um, but, you know, I took lots from that and I'm sure you did as well. So, you know, we're not going into detail, but we acknowledge that remote education can be digital or non-digital and I think it's important to remember that that sometimes we can set our learners things to do that doesn't necessarily need or require that digital platform particularly important if our learners are struggling to access that technology we also know that remote education can be synchronous exactly what we're doing at the moment or it can be asynchronous. So it can happen kind of in a non-live event. And again, that gives us flexibility that actually teaching and learning face-to-face -face doesn't necessarily give us. Face-to-face -face teaching and learning is always synchronous. Our learners are always there in the classroom. Um, so we have you know, lots of things that we can do with them, but remote education, it can be asynchronous and that will give us some advantages. And of course, even before we get to thinking about, well, what are we going to teach and what do we want our learners to learn? We just need to consider things like the school and the class context, kind of whether our both uh, us as teachers and our learners have got that access to IT, whether we're talking about software or hardware. And of course, we have those spaces to learn. So we acknowledge that all of that goes on. But of course, we're not really we're not going to be delving into that a little bit today. And of course, as it says at the bottom of the screen, this is a new phenomenon. We have never had a situation where we've had this length of time away from the classroom. So there are no rules. What we hope to do with you today is just stimulate some thinking and just give you some things to think about and perhaps ask each other in the chat box. So, of course, you are going to have some decisions as we move forward to thinking, what is it that we want our learners to learn? So do we carry on with the plans? We know that we're going into uh, potentially another lockdown at some point. What will you do? Do you carry on? You kind of think, well, I was planning to do whatever it was next week, so I'll just carry on. Or do we stop and think? hang on a minute, if I'm moving from face to face to remote education, should I stop and adjust and teach easier content? Easier, not in terms of cognitively easier, but easier in terms of being able to access it uh, through that remote education platform. We also need to consider that prior learning. What is it that we hope our students have retained and therefore building on that is really important. And of course, what's your priority? Is your priority to get through the curriculum no matter what? Or is your priority to really just keep uh, your learners excited and keep that love of learning going? In which case, we might choose to do different things in that remote education environment. And of course, I think we need to acknowledge those two things at the bottom of the screen, that online teaching and learning, it is different to face-to-face -face teaching and learning. And actually that's a whole other question that we could go into, but let's just acknowledge that it is different and it does take longer. You know, certainly we've all found that whether we're doing some training things or whether we're teaching in the classrooms, we could get through more content and do more things if we're face to face. So those kind of things really do just need to uh, take into consideration as we move forward with our session. So here's a little pause for thought. Some big questions here for you to think about, and it'd be lovely for you to, to engage in the chat box and just say perhaps what you're initially thinking as I ask these questions. So here's the first one. Do learners need to be taught the whole curriculum? 
big question, isn't it? And actually, it's a yes and no answer. Of course, we would both acknowledge the importance of a broad and balanced curriculum. We know that knowledge is made up and it's connected. So we're not we're not saying that they don't need to be taught the whole curriculum, but do they need to be taught the whole curriculum in that same depth? So really building on that second question, does all knowledge require the same depth of teaching? And actually, it doesn't. But it's not as easy as saying it doesn't because it will be different and unique to your situation and the, the learners that you have in front of you. So what one person will think they need to do more of with one cohort of learners, somebody else will say, actually, mine, they don't need that. And therefore, that third question, is it easier to teach other stuff when teaching face to face? Now, we've put other stuff kind of in those inverted commas, because actually, let's just think for a minute about, uh, let's say, a science lesson where we've got an experiment. We really want children to engage in this experiment. That's going to be pretty tricky to do in the online environment. So what we might do is move that out of the curriculum. We might put it two or three months ahead in the future to think, well, when we're back face to face, we'll bring that back online. So certainly there are things that we're going to be making decisions on. But here's our conjecture. If is it true that if we learn less, but we learn it in a deeper way, then that's better than learning lots superficially. So I'm not going to say too much about that at the moment, but that's the big conjecture and ties back into the title of this session. So does a little knowledge go a long way? And we're going to investigate that as we go through the session. But I think for now, I am going to hand over to Sharon to do the science part. OK, thank you, Alison. And thank you for leaving us with that great conjecture there. You know, certainly that question, isn't it, around you know, the extent uh, to the depth of what we're learning but also the coverage as well. We're going to really revisit that and build on that as we move through this session. And we've had, my goodness, what a, a challenging 12 months we've all had in education. And it's really enabled us, hasn't it, to, to reflect on what we do. And it's really enabled us to question when we think about that whole concept of learning, about what our approach is in our school, what our pedagogy is as well. Because we've been in this context where we've been delivering that remote um, education and that remote environment. And we've had to make some quite significant changes as a result of that. So what we've done today is to think about that question of learning is less and started to think a little bit about what the evidence-based research is, what the science uh, tells us about that. So I'm going to just talk very briefly about that. Some of it may well be familiar to you, but it's also thinking about what the science can tell us about learning because that's a really good starting point. Um, so we're going to look at some of the, the evidence from cognitive psychology and neuroscience and it's really relevant to us as teachers as well in terms of helping us to think about how our students students learn. So before and to get us started, I'm going to start asking you a question to start thinking about your own knowledge, your own memory and your own learning. So our first challenge for you this morning is to think about what are you good at remembering and why we'd really like to know and you can see there we've got a code for you to use Menti so if you can open that uh, on your phone or in another browser window and use that code then you will be able to share that with us so please do go on to Menti and tell us what you're good at remembering and why and it's a really interesting question it's, it's one of those questions isn't it that we sometimes ask ourselves have we ever stopped to really think about that um, that we just recall some information very quickly. So Alison, what are you good at remembering and why? Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? Um, it's really interesting. I, I, I think I'm good at remembering things that I kind of, I almost don't know why I'm good at remembering them. So I can remember my diary for a whole week. You know, if I've looked at it maybe a week ago, I could then recall exactly what I'm doing, kind of every minute of the day, you know, where I need to be or, you know, that type of thing. Um, and yet I, I find it really hard to remember when my friend's birthdays are. So, you know, yeah. you would think it would be the other way around, wouldn't it? Um, and of yeah. course, you know, I, I kind of I know when their birthdays are, but it kind of just seems to kind of go straight out of my head. Um, so really, yeah. really bizarre. Um, what about you, Sharon? What are you what are you good at remembering? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about this before today as, as well. And, you know, the, the funny thing is, is it's things that sometimes you don't 
you don't think about day to day on a day to day basis, isn't it? So one of the things I thought about is, um, you know, I, I, learned, I learned the piano about 30, 40 years ago, and I can still sit down and play pieces that I practice for piano examinations without the music, even when I haven't played them for a long time. But also, bizarrely, remembering quotes from films as well, films that I really enjoyed. Um, and I can just remember phrases or key points at that. Um, so it's really interesting because it's, it's so different, isn't it, for all of us? And I can see some great things coming through on the Menti. Thank you so much for that. So we've got names, um, important events, places that you visit, you know, good things. That's a lovely thing to be able to, you know, when you remember in your long-term memory, all those sort of fantastic characteristics that you remember about people. Uh, captions, that's a really interesting one. Stories. Yeah, I um, love the stories one. Yeah. Lovely. Remember the stories. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Conversation as well. And that's that can sometimes that's that's great depending on, you know, how you're using that information, isn't it? It's really useful, isn't it? And we've got incidents and a lovely one there, how I felt. Now, that's yeah. that's a fascinating and a, 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 I suppose a completely different topic, isn't it? Because we know the role that emotion plays in learning as well. It's mm. certainly what we're talking about today, which is starting to think about our, our long term memory. So thank you so much for those. And, and as we said, you know, keep please keep posting in the chat if you think of anything else or want to share anything else with us. But thank you so much for those those contributions. What I love. I think that's marvellous. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Number. Alison, you yeah. can see that one number there. Absolutely. I know, I'm so, excited. <laughs> yeah. so thank you very much. Thank you, James. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to thinking about that. So what we're talking about a lot today is learning. And as a really good starting point today, it's really interesting to think about what we mean by learning. And, and if you have that shared definition in your school, does everybody have some real clarity around that? But also, do they have that clarity about what we mean by remote learning as well? And, and what that you know perhaps looks like what that feels like and what that what that involves so i'm just going to put and share with you today a quote on the slide um just as a suggestion for a shared different definition we might start with today so this is a quote from kirsch and Sweller and clark and, and they define learning as something that has happened in our mind and in our long-term memory so they suggest that it involves a shift in having something that stays in that long-term memory and that's really important for thinking about what we're we're going to be thinking about in, in a second with regards to less is more, but also importantly building on, on what we mean by memory and learning. So to think a little bit more about how thinking and learning occurs, we're going to look at a simple model of memory. And this is taken from some work by Daniel Willingham. And this kind of summarises, if you like, in a way, it's, a, it's a, a nice model to look at the systems that we use as well. So it can again help us understand why thinking can be hard, it can also be problematic but also can help us think about learning design particularly remote learning design so that we can make that easier for our students and also help us as teachers perhaps reduce some of that variation that we see in uh, that development of knowledge sometimes in learners so the model shows us that working uh, we've got memory divided into two parts we've got working memory and we've got our long-term memory now, all learning suggests, this model suggests that all learning starts with us paying attention to something that's in the, in, in the environment and that information in the environment. Now, that might be something that teachers, we as teachers present to our learners. A thinking takes place when we give attention to that information and we combine it with information from our long term memory. And that process between environment and long term memory happens within our working memory. So that's where we begin to form learning and we begin to apply it as well. Now, the long term memory, as we've just seen from that lovely activity, and thank you again for your contributions there. That tells us, doesn't it, that that's what makes us absolutely unique as individuals. And we can see from all those responses that we shared then that there were some very, very different things that we remembered that, that were defined in our long term memory. And that contains our memories, it's our life experiences, but it's also where we have that knowledge that we've acquired through thinking. And that's where it's stored. And of course, we have limitless capacity. Now, working memory is where the conscious and effortful act of thinking takes place. So if we present our learners, for example, with some new subject terminology or we present them with some new vocabulary, that's where they begin to understand and begin to apply that. So learners might blend the sounds represented by letters into a word or they may even listen to a sequence of events in a story while trying to understand or to think about the inference in that story as well. <laughs> 
So it allows the brain, working memory allows the brain to briefly hold that information while it's needed in the short term. And that's the thing like you were saying, isn't it, Alison? While we sometimes don't remember things if we don't use them after that, working memory, you know, it only keeps things in place for a very short time. I like to think of it as our post-it note, our working memory in your head. So it just has something that we hang on to briefly in working memory before we begin to connect it or we begin to link it or organise it to other, other information so that it can move into that long-term memory as well. And we've talked about the role attention plays in that process, and that's really important for our less is more concept. And we will unpick that a little bit more in our session today. So when we do, what we see from that model is if we don't use both our working memory and our long term memory, we forget. So if we don't practice that retrieval from long term memory, information goes, but also our working memory requires a lot of conscious effort. It's very fragile. So we lose it quite quickly. And, and some studies and research actually suggests that information in working memory can be lost as quickly as 20 seconds unless we actually rehearse that as well. So that model might perhaps be a simple model of memory, but in theory and in practice, when we think about our learners, we know that it's a lot more challenging that for some of them, isn't it? It can be a real struggle, isn't it? To sometimes remember content, sometimes remember the knowledge that we've taught as well. And when we start to think about our learners, we know that working memory can increase quite steadily from the age of four. So if we're thinking about our youngest primary learners up until the age of about 14, when they become very close to adult. And as it suggests there on the quote, the average 11 year old has a capacity that's quite close to adult levels, adult levels, sorry. But if we think about this, what we can see from that quote is that in a typical class, we can actually have a huge range of capacity with regard to working memory. And that does have implications, doesn't it, for how we design learning, not only in a class based setting, but particularly in a remote based setting as well. And if we think about working memory being that kind of workspace that our students use, to actually hold information while they're doing other things, then we can see where these challenges come in. So for example, we've got learners that are writing a sentence, but while they're doing that in their working memory, they're also thinking about how they're gonna spell those individual words. But we've also got learners that have got a list of instructions from a teacher, but then they're also carrying out an individual steps and a task. And this again, thinking about the remote context, and I know a lot of our learners like us are very familiar now with the tools that we use, but I'm sure particularly some of your experiences, when we first started using remote learning, some of those learners were taking time to get to know all the different tools on a platform, and they're trying to do that while also trying to respond to a task as well. So there are some implications there. So this brings us on to understanding what we mean by cognitive load theory, and this is based on the work of John Sweller. And it's again what we know about working memory and also thinking about what we know about long term memory. And when we talk about cognitive load, it's thinking about the amount of information processing required to complete a learning task. So thinking about our remote learning, what cognitive load is being placed on our students when we, we do that learning design? And you can see from the slide there that it's distinguished, we distinguish between three different types. So we've got our intrinsic load, which is how challenging a task is. So it's what learners have to be able to do to complete something, and it draws on their knowledge as well. We've then got what we call our extraneous load, and that's the way in which we present those problems to our learners. So that's the complexity of what needs to be learned. So in some ways, if you put yourself in our, the, the shoes of our learners, it's about what they have to be able to do to complete a task. And then finally, we've got what we call our germane load. And that is where we have the working memory and the effort required to process information and create what we call our schema, which some of you will be familiar with. And if we have a very complex task, it's linked to our intrinsic load, the higher that germane load is. Now, schemas, I'm sure some of you um, have heard of, particularly those of you that perhaps maybe even work in early years, but those are the cognitive structures where we store our information. So it's how we store and organise information in our, in our heads as well. And we construct schema for everything and it helps us integrate knowledge and to connect knowledge as well. So if we talk about a bird, for example, as soon as I say the word a bird, many of you will be drawing on your own schema and you'll be thinking about the different features that make up a bird. So you'll be thinking about things like wings, beaks, feathers, flight, and making those connections straight away. 
And what we do know with schema is that the more we use them, the more they become automated. So when you get in your car to drive it, then you're not perhaps using a lot of your, if you like, your conscious processing because it's become so rehearsed to us that there's certain things we do automatically as well. So to kind of illustrate this in practice and to, uh, to think about this in, in terms of our own experiences and to help you again reflect on how learners experience this, I'm going to hand you back to Alison and we're going to um, have a, an opportunity to experience some of that cognitive loading. Brilliant. Thank you, Sharon. OK, so you'll see a calculation has appeared on the screen. Uh, can you give it a go, people? Uh, so calculate two, add two, add four. What is the answer? I'm kind of waiting with anticipation <laughs> to see the chat box. Here we go. Oh, Naomi's off straight away. Oh, brilliant. There we go. Oh, we've obviously got a very good job. Fabulous. Of <laughs> answers. So I think what we're trying to see, keep going. That's brilliant. Thanks, people. Um, we can see that actually that wasn't a huge, um, a huge effort to do in terms of what I was asking you to do. So what I'm going to do next is um, I'm going to ask you to do another at calculation i'm going to ask you to resist using your calculators or your <laughs> phones for this one um now uh, can somebody move the slide on for me please that's great i don't know if it's uh where's our next slide oh here we go uh th oh there we go brilliant thank you so the next the next one that i'd like you to do with kind of in your head is 93 <laughs> multiplied by 543 and i think we should start that clock james 30 seconds everybody let's give it a go no pressure what are you thinking oh yeah i'm still gonna see if it's still sunny yep yeah, still sunny. yeah just 20 everybody. seconds left <laughs> oh, oh, oh oh need a calculator uh yeah I'm not sure uh -oh. mm, yeah oh my maybe. goodness oh, time's look, going look, quickly yeah no idea 10 no seconds idea. <laughs> really <laughs> And of course, I am being a little bit unfair, trying to uh, to uh, to cause you that cognitive conflict. The numbers are floating <laughs> in my mind. I love that. Uh, oh, we've got an answer from Fatima oh, and Ritka. God, Brilliant. Piece, well done. OK, so what we were trying to do there was to demonstrate that actually, you know, doing these kinds of things, you, you know, it requires a different level. So having looked at 93 multiplied by 543, um, I have to say, you know, being a maths person, I still might have panicked. I might have thought, oh, my goodness, I don't know. 30 seconds, not sure. What I might have kind of tried to interpret that with is by saying, well, OK, I know that multiplication is linked to repeated addition. So uh, I could have 93, add 93, add 93. But that's going to take up, that's going to be quite a long bit of paper because I've got 543, 93s. Or I could use my commutativity knowledge. So I'm drawing on some knowledge. And this time it could be 543, add 543 and so on again it's probably going to take me a long time and i bet i'm going to make a mistake with all of that adding up so so maybe i'm going to look for something else maybe i'm going to think well hang on a minute 93 is close to 90 does that help me could i partition 93 into a 90 and a 3 543 well again could i do some rounding up there you see what i'm doing and here's the conjecture, going back to that conjecture. Do we need to teach the entire curriculum? It's a yes and a no question. Of course, we need to, to offer the curriculum. But if the curriculum was to say to teach two digits multiplied by three digits, I, what I need to be able to teach my learners are strategies to do that. Have I actually given them the specific calculation, 93 multiplied by 543. Do you know what? I didn't do it. I don't think we used that calculation. We might have used 92 multiplied by 543, but that's not going to give me the answer. So you can start to see what we're doing, that actually, if we start to teach our learners in ways that help them to remember, but also draw on strategies that they can apply, 
then actually we can start to think about that knowledge being a little bit smaller perhaps than having to teach absolutely everything. So it is that yes and no question. So we just thought that might hopefully engage you in a little bit of an active way today, because it is hard, isn't it, not being in the same room. So hopefully you enjoyed that challenge. Well done to those people who got the answer. You are definitely quicker at working mentally than I am. But I'm going to hand back to Sharon just for a little bit more science. Okay, thank you, Alison. So just a couple of things we want to show you. And again, building on what Alison was saying there, you know, certainly about that less is more, but also about our, our content. If we, we think about that ability to remember, this is a really interesting piece of work that was done by Ebbinghaus. It's a, a classic experiment that was done some time ago, but it's called the forgetting curve. And it shows us uh, the decay that we have in information. And actually, they, the suggestion is that up to, after a first few days, we could actually lose up to 70% of what we've learned. And that has you know, quite a significant implications, doesn't it, from when we're thinking about teaching and learning, and particularly, again, in a remote context around the amount of content that we're sharing with learners, but also around, as we've just uh, had demonstrated by Alison, around the complexity of, of tasks as well and the cognitive load. So what we do know from looking at this is, if we want to support our learners in using that new knowledge and thinking, it helps us think about how we're going to deliver that. So an important goal when we think about it would be really to get our learners to think about the meaning in learning, but also how we engage our learning, our, our students in paying attention to the material that's being learned, because both of those things will really help us determine what ends up in the student's long term memory as well. We've got a quote here for, from William for you. And again, it just reminds us, doesn't it? We've come a long way, haven't we, thinking about you know, the science of learning and how we use that in education. Um, but there's a lot of really good stuff around at the moment that's helpful to look at. And that's why we, we've drawn on some of that today as well, because it's about what we're doing to help really maximise those learning opportunities. And in this situation where we're still needing to deliver, you know, many countries are, are remote learning, then how are we really making the most of that in terms of building in those opportunities for learners to retain that knowledge and to learn as effectively as possible as well. So just a couple of things progress and learning that's something that we think about a lot isn't it in education we have lots of discussion and debate about it as well and when we think about progress in learning do does progress in learning in a class context look the same as progress in learning in a remote context and again what kind of conversations maybe are we having in our our schools around this and in our developing that shared understanding and we often think of progress in learning, don't we? Something that we do at the start of the year, perhaps, or we look at repeat a, a test or assessment at the end of the year. It can sometimes be quite a summative process. So we, we look at the progress that learners have made from starting points, perhaps to the end points. But it's useful when we think about that science of learning to think about how you define progress. And there's some suggestions on the slide there. You know, how, how is it defined in your school? You know, what are you thinking about when you're teaching your learners over a series of lessons remotely about how you're going to recognize that progress and actually when we start to think about the science of learning progress might simply mean knowing more and actually remembering more and if that's the case how are we perhaps you know building in those opportunities to recognize that or certainly enable our learners to apply that understanding of what they've learned so that we can actually see see that uh, that progress and it is a challenge to measure that accurately we know that in education but it's really useful just to think about that for a moment as to what that might look like for you particularly in a remote context and then finally we've talked about this concept of knowledge being connected old knowledge being connected to new knowledge making those connections and being able to connect those dots in a very intuitive way we see that through the cambridge spiral curriculum there's that opportunity to build on that previous learning and to add new learning to that as well and we know that knowledge the theory here is that knowledge is generative it's sticky isn't it it actually helps you know form that schemata that we talked about earlier as well so if we're talking to our students about time particularly younger students once they start to understand a bit more about the concept of time 
we can see that they're developing a much more complex schema about what we mean by past when we talk about it, what we mean by present, and we, what we mean by future as well. But as it suggests on that slide, that points, doesn't it, to the importance of really thinking about effective curriculum design. Are we planning those opportunities remotely? Are we sequencing things so that new knowledge and skills can be built on what's taught, been taught before as well? So I'm going to hand you back to Alison now because we're going to start thinking a little bit more about some of those practical implications, um, certainly around that science of learning and some of the things that we can use in remote design and delivery. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sharon. And actually, it's another opportunity um, for our lovely participants to have a go at using Menti um, and really think about that question. We're really interested to know how have you repurposed your curriculum for the remote environment? So even if you're back. Um, you know, what, what kind of changes did you make there? So we'll just give you a little, a couple, a few minutes to think about that. The code for Menti is on the screen again. So it'd be lovely to see what some of you are saying there. So Sharon, uh, what have you been seeing as you've been going around? Uh, well, I think, recently? I think certainly it's been that confidence and that time more than ever where we've really looked haven't we at the the amount of which has been delivered and really thought about the the content and it is that that going back to that question is it a lot that we're thinking about today it's that quality versus content kind of scenario isn't it you know what are we teaching and to what extent and what depth are we teaching that as well and I think it's really enabled schools hasn't it to look at how much information is being used in a remote context but also kind of really sharply focus even more so perhaps on what we want learners to achieve during that session or that series of lessons that we're promoting so I think content has been a really significant area hasn't it for a lot of schools in thinking about the quality of what's happening in the remote environment is that similar to your experiences Alison as well yeah I, I mean I've been so impressed with with the teachers you know that I've been working with you know they've really thought about not just carrying on with kind of you know because it said yeah. I was doing something next week um really kind of thinking about what what is it that they can really engage their learners with in that online environment so I love that you know have you repurposed the curriculum yes tell us more <laughs> I'm interested yes, what is it yes. what did you do um that's yeah. a lovely one as well isn't it preferring to go with concepts rather than focusing on the syllabus so yeah. important isn't it to make sure that you know that well-being and that you know that mindset that growth mindset is continued and maintained in that environment mm -hmm. and of course as we said at the beginning you know there are no rules nobody's written the rule book for this it's all going to be very different depending on you know our context and our situations and of course, you know, what we are trying to, to get out of, what is our priority? But certainly I've been very impressed by teachers' flexibility, by their innovation, really coming up with very creative ways to continue to engage their learners using parts of the curriculum, but that actually may not have been coming up in their curriculum scheme of work for another three or four months. I think that's a great yeah. one, isn't it? Using more of a flipped classroom, Certainly, yeah. I saw that in the chat that somebody had said, you know, actually, we've used that a lot more. Absolutely agree. Um, mm. And again, absolutely making it simple and focusing on that main concept. I think that's key, isn't it? We know that for whatever reason, we can't get through as much content or discussion mm. or whatever it is in an online environment. We can do more uh, face to face. So thinking how to make it easy for students to accept the lesson easily. I think that's really key, absolutely. Um, yeah, we've got those blended learning techniques that are coming in. Oh, I'm so pleased somebody's mentioned assessment. So AFL, learning. yes. Really good. Yeah. It's been hard, actually. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's been one of the things that I've had to work hard at, remembering to, to keep that formative assessment in particular going. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, absolutely. And it's just lovely to see there as well that, you know, I know that as teachers, regardless of circumstance, we, we really do, you know, focus on our learners, don't we? We really do allow the needs of them to, to drive what we're doing. But I think in the remote context, in some ways, we've just looked at that so much more deeply, haven't we, in a way? It's kind of enabled us to really think about that in uh, in different ways. And I love that idea, Alison, about using the, the syllabus um, as, a, as a sort of almost like a skeleton isn't it and a scaffold yes. um to deliver yes. learning 
Brilliant. Oh, there's some great responses there. Fantastic. Simplifying lessons, including more of the online resources and uh -huh. tools. Definitely. I've certainly used a lot more this year. Integrating topics and then, of course, reducing the amount of work given, breaking it down into smaller steps and really kind of focusing it. So, again, you know, I think what we've learned is that there are no rules. It's definitely about what is it that our learners need and what you know it's not just about carrying on so kind of back to that you know a little knowledge goes a long way wow. Actually, you know being able to really pick out the things that matter are key so that's fantastic do keep adding to those because we're going to try and capture those and, and send those uh, to participants later but shall we just hop back into the powerpoint that would be great fantastic Oh, and my computer's being glitchy again. So are we seeing the PowerPoint? We are, yes. Brilliant. OK, so let's have a look. That kind of now trying to think about aligning the curriculum with that remote learning. So, you know, as it says on the top of the screen, really think about what is it that is your priority? Not the person next to you, not the person in the next school, but your priority. And we've just given you some ideas to think about there. So is it about delivering more? theoretical content as opposed to that practical content and we're not saying don't deliver that practical content what we're saying is maybe wait until we're back into a face-to-face -face context so just taking ownership of your scheme of work there and um, choosing learning that fits with remote education not just carrying on i think that came across really strongly when people were contributing with that last mentee activity uh, perhaps doing some more teacher modeling you know, I know that we are very much about active learning and really wanting our learners to be at the centre of their learning and problem solving and really thinking about it. But sometimes in, a, in an online situation, we might need to do a little bit more of that, what we would call direct instruction. Uh, Maximising digital tools. Yes, I think people were saying that, weren't they? And having that real time scaffolding and feedback. So important to carry on with that formative assessment. That's exactly how we know what to do next. So just some things for you to think about there. Um, can we can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we, we we kind of we we kind of put that question up, didn't we, at the beginning about you know do you need to teach the whole curriculum? Yes and no. So I want you to look at those two images that are on the screen. And here, hopefully, this will give you a lovely analogy to take away from the session. So we can see the eggs and we can see the ingredients. Um, and these are all of the things that we would need, that knowledge and those skills, in order to make that amazing chocolate cake that you can see, or a slice of it, uh, a slice of it, you know, that chocolate cake there. So I think the conjecture here is that sometimes do we focus too much on the outcome, in this case, making the chocolate cake rather than the process? And in this case, the process is, so what ingredients, what content do I need, but what skills do I need as well? Because here's the thing, if I can make a chocolate cake, then I should also be able to apply that knowledge to make other types of cakes as well. And that's what we mean about that little knowledge goes a long way. It's not that we have to then teach how to make a chocolate cake on a Monday, how to make a carrot cake on a Tuesday, how to make a lemon cake on a Wednesday and so on. Actually, what we need to do is to say, well, actually, we're going to teach the, you know, using that content and that knowledge to make a cake and then start to apply the different ways of kind of, you know, changing that outcome. So I really do love that. And that question on the screen, which is more important, the ingredients or the cake? And hopefully, you know, if you were in the room, you'd all be saying it's the ingredient. Of course, it's the ingredients. And therefore, that goes straight back to our title of. So therefore, does a little knowledge go a long way? And we would suggest that perhaps it does. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So again, here's okay. just a big big question for you thinking then so what does that mean for day-to-day -day lesson planning and curriculum delivery in the remote environment so that's what we're thinking about so if we just move on we're going to go back to that phrase that we've been using that less is more phrase so again we've just popped a few things on the screen for you to think about so i guess what we're, we're kind of you know getting you to think about is 
really thinking about and prioritizing really carefully which knowledge and skills, content and skills, do we want to use? So at the moment, we're in a very tricky situation where we might not be able to get through the whole curriculum. I know some of you have got you know, exams coming up, IGCSEs, A-levels, and we feel that we do need to give that content. But if we can't, or you know, if we kind of find ourselves in a situation where actually the, you know, the curriculums are huge, aren't they? What is it that we need to prioritise? Perhaps the curriculum says that our learners need to be able to make a chocolate cake and a lemon cake. But actually, if we just draw back from that and think, so what skills and knowledge can I give them that would enable them to make both? I think that's what we're saying there. So really thinking about that transferable knowledge. Then thinking about that, that ex expanding on and that having that interconnected web of knowledge. We know that lots and lots of knowledge is connected. The chocolate cake and the carrot cake are connected. They're same and yet they're different. So we can think about that less is more in that way. Thinking about that focused learning instruction. What do we absolutely need our learners to do? And then, of course, providing that time for that processing. Like somebody popped in the chat a little while ago. It was, you know, we do need to kind of keep that revision going. Of course, we do need, as Sharon pointed out earlier, if something's in our long term memory, we do need to remind ourselves. We do need to use that knowledge in order to keep it there. So again, having those smaller chunks of learning is really, really powerful. And then, of course, thinking about manipulating and maximising the environment. So really kind of making sure that what we're doing is fit for purpose. OK, back over to you, Sharon. Okay, thank you, Alison. So thinking about that concept of less is more, we're going to start thinking a little bit more about how we can be content rich and not necessarily content led. And this is really, and I'm sure it's true for you as well, Alison. I know it's happened to me, but how often do you have that experience where you're working with learners and they act as if they've never heard of a topic or some content but you know that you've covered it yes you've covered it it's been covered in a previous year group or perhaps even by you in a previous term or even last week and sometimes you're talking to them to about it sometimes they're just unable to kind of refer and return to some of those concepts and some of that content that's been covered as well so we're just going to have a, a another activity for you to have a go at now uh, just to experience that a little bit and to think a little bit more deeply about that and what that might mean for your learners so I'm going to show you a paragraph and I'm going to give you only 30 seconds to read this paragraph and to study it and then I'm going to ask you some questions about it so here's the, the text coming up so you have 30 seconds Quite a tough paragraph, I have to say, Karen. It is. <laughs> Interesting there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to start thinking about those following questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to only let you have a very quick look at those first two questions on there. And then I'm going to move the slide back so you can't see the text anymore. So that first question is, when were George and Tony in Dolon? When were George and Tony in Dolon? Dolon, sorry. <laughs> you can put your answer into the chat box. That would be brilliant. Can you remember from looking at that text and from studying that text? So we've got some answers coming there. Last Fern Day. Yep, thank you. Oh, yeah, so we've got brilliant. two there coming through. Oh, they're a great now, making that a little bit more challenging, what did the Ditsy Strezel do to George's grep? Can anybody remember that? What did the Ditsy Strezel do to George's grep? Can anyone remember? Boofing, fantastic. We've got a reply coming through there. Boofed, wonderful. Thank you so much. OK, let me just take you back to that text. Now, if that was a test or an assessment, most of you would have passed that because you probably, you know, would have got those answers correct. But actually, what you've probably gathered from looking at that is it's absolute nonsense, isn't it? That whole paragraph is nonsense. There's not really any meaningful learning or learning with understanding, is there there? And actually, that won't be retained in your long term memory. When you leave our session today, you'll forget 
what was in that paragraph. You've only had a short chance to study it. And just a point of reflection here as well, because we see that sometimes in our students, don't we? That sometimes they're just memorising content so that they can answer questions. But what they're not doing is actually having that sort of deep understanding of what it is that they've learned, or they're not transferring that to that new information or that existing information that existing information that then puts it into their long-term memory as well. So when we think about that, here's a, a point of reflection, some answers on there. But just thinking about that is the key question. Are we putting so much into the, the so much content into our curriculum? And are we really trying to do that sort of that content led, is it content led so that we're actually giving them so much to remember that some of our students are simply committing those facts to memory and we know there are some benefits of that don't get me wrong we know that you know sometimes that's really important certainly in preparing for tests or for examinations we all do it don't we but actually when we think about that lifelong learning and building on that learning and that process are we giving our learners that opportunity to really start to think about how they can accumulate knowledge over time and develop that deep understanding and they can have that opportunity to reflect and really think quite deeply, critically, and creatively around the content and the, the information that they're experiencing in their learning. So one of the things that we're, we're going to think about from that today is what that means for implementing the curriculum and we've, we've started to think about that through our session if we think about that concept less is more and certainly thinking about how we begin to unpack particularly in a remote context as well and um, thinking about that in simple terms so there's just some suggestions here on the slide as some steps that we could perhaps begin to work through or to think about more more uh, more simply in terms of our practice as well so when we think about that big picture are we weaving together those threads of the subject are we really thinking about what those threads are do we pick our curriculum to recognize those and are we thinking about what we want our learners to walk away with are we thinking about what that looks like in terms of the taught curriculum but also the assessed curriculum as well and when we start to think about what that might mean in practice that also links doesn't it to our big picture to our school vision and values to the subject that you're teaching or the areas of learning that you're focusing on and the needs particularly and Alison talked about this we've talked about this a lot you know, is the needs of our learners, what's the big picture, how does the, the subject threads, how does that link to the needs of our learners as well, what do they need to know, and what is it we want them to return to, to have time to study in depth, to, to create that deep learning that we've talked about, so that's where our perhaps less is more um, comes in, isn't it, thinking about that, how are we then structuring our learning, how are we breaking that down, one strategy is we can think of that curriculum, as a, the curriculum as perhaps a series of questions that needs to be answered as well. And actually, when we start thinking about that and um, the depth of content, we can make those really strategic decisions. We can make some key points of the curriculum, what we call our cornerstones, our anchor points, so that we can revisit those over time. But then we can organise and integrate, connect and combine the rest of the curriculum around those ideas. And it's this um, move, isn't it, from covering content that we talked about to using content. So thinking more about you know, less thinking about what we need to teach, but more of how we need to teach that as well. And then I'm just going to move on and share with you a quote um, from Cambridge Primary Science. So thinking about how we'd use that, that could be our big picture there, couldn't it? The summary that we have there. You know, what would we draw from that as our threads of learning? We might think about practical skills. We might take explaining the world around us, learners' awareness of science. So how are we disrupting that big picture to then start to look at those opportunities to develop those key concepts and to create that real sense of a depth in the, the content courage that we're, we're sharing with learners? So finally, before I hand you back to Alison, just to think a little bit more about some of those curriculum strategies. This is a quote from Myatt, and, and this just reminds us, doesn't it, as well, about do we see our curriculum as a narrative? Is it a, do, we, do we identify our curriculum? Do we think of it like a story so that we can see those key themes and the threads that run through it? And do we think about then how we're going to communicate that to students so that they can make those connections? Are we making them explicit for learners when we're sharing our curriculum content and our, when we're covering the curriculum and it's an interesting way to think about how teachers are doing that in their schools at the moment and they're also doing that remotely so some of the things that I've come across is perhaps teachers just sharing it on a slide in remote lessons it's just that visual marker or that reminder isn't it why are we learning this where does this fit perhaps in that conversation around
around how the lesson fits into the curriculum as a whole. So I'm going to hand you back to Alison now. We're just going to have a look at some more ideas around that uh, structuring of learning. Brilliant. So we're going to finish this. I've got four slides and I'm going to share them with you really quickly because I'm conscious of the time. But this idea about interleaving the curriculum, we've already talked that, you know, whichever subject and whichever phase we're teaching, the curriculum is very much interconnected. And it works on the idea that, you know, that they're not separate bits of knowledge that we need to teach our learners. Actually, we can make lots of connections. So again, coming back to that idea that a little knowledge does go a long way, actually it's because our curriculums are set up in a spiral way, that actually they help that long-term retention of information, and therefore creating that rich curriculum weaves that big picture of that subject. So if we go on to the next slide and just think about that, this idea about how many times should we come back and think about something and, and engage with something. And I do love this graph. Because if you, you can see that when you learn something for the first time, that blue line, actually we kind of we lose quite a lot of what it is. But when we come back to it a second time, we still lose, but not quite as much as the first time. Then look at what happens with the third and the fourth and the fifth. You know, by the time we get to that fifth time of remembering and recalling and using some information, that retention has gone up dramatically. And that's the idea of what we might call revision or retrieval practice. But it's also important to, to acknowledge that the learning is spaced out. So if we're trying to bunch learning together in, a, in one time frame, that's not actually going to be as advantageous as being able to space it out and draw on it. So let's have a think, if we go on to the next slide, what about some of these habits that we may have fallen into? So certainly I know that I'm really guilty. I've got a brilliant activity. I want to be able to use it. And sometimes what I need to stop and think about is it might be a great activity, but is it really the, the best one that I need to use? So rather than trying to reverse engineer, I've got this activity. So what can I pull out and get out from the learning? I always need to start with, well, what is it I want and need my learners to learn? If that activity matches, brilliant. But if it doesn't, I need to let go of that activity. And then certainly thinking about, you know, covering those lessons and really kind of having that, that lesson coverage just because it's written down in the book, just because somebody else has written it, I don't necessarily need to go through it all if it's not applicable to my learners. So then finally, let's just have a think about kind of, so how do we reduce demands on working memory? And we've just popped a few things on the slide for you to think about. Now, we're really out of time at the moment, but just thinking about considering what that cognitive load has and what it does for the students, reflecting on how best to, pre to present that information, thinking about using worked examples, thinking about scaffolding, removing unessential information, making connections, and then, of course, simplifying that that information that's particularly complex. These are all things that we can do that will reduce working memory, particularly in that online environment. So it's a whistle stop tour, but you will get the slides and hopefully that's just given you a few more things to think about. So Sharon, I'm going to hand back over to you to wrap up. Our Thank lesson. you, Alison. Yeah. So just really in the last minute or so that we have less, our uh, our question was, so does a little knowledge go a long way? So please just pop your thoughts and comments in the chat. We're just really interested to hear what's really kind of resonated with you today in the session and thinking about what that might mean for your practice and perhaps, you know, your remote context and learning going forward as well. So please share your thoughts and comments. We're really interested to hear those as well. And as Alison said, you will get slides, you will get access to recording of the session as well. But please share your thoughts uh, as we conclude and draw our session to a close today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much and a really big thank you to James and the events team and um, yeah, as Sharon said, thank you ever so much for joining us and uh, we hope you've really enjoyed this conference. We certainly have. I feel like I've learnt loads um, and we hope to see you at some point in the future, either online or who knows, face to face. Thank so you so stay safe and keep well, everybody. Great. Thank you.